Well, hello again, everyone. Phil Giuliani here on One and Messiah on Messianic Lamb Network. Thanks for tuning in. I'm really glad that you're here. And this program is here live every Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you go to the Lamb Network site, which is lambnetwork.tv, lambnetwork.tv, there is an on demand tab where you can find when this program or any other program is broadcast again. If you want to hear any of them over again, or if you hear, if you watch this program today and then later tonight, you say, I don't know, I want to see part of that again. I don't know what this guy's talking about, but I want to check it out. You can feel free to find it on the on demand and watch it again at your leisure um, with the pauses and so forth. And then usually about, uh, well, the following day or the day after that, it usually goes on my YouTube channel, which is One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries. One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries. There's hundreds of programs and teachings and lectures and preachings and I don't know what all, Bible studies and a lot of hundreds of different things you can watch at your leisure. And one in Messiah is, I always like to start out because it may be the first time that you're tuning in. <clears throat> you may wonder what it is. And uh, this ministry started in um, spring, the spring of 2016. And it's based, of course, on connecting the Tanakh and the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, because the Bible is one continuing panorama of the plan of salvation. And it goes from Genesis 3.15 until the end. That is basically all the plan of salvation. And Torah prefigures Messiah, how he will come, what he will do, how he will do it, and how uh, sin will be dealt with. The prophets that tell the, the people how they are to live in God's law, and how they are to be devoted to him and to follow him. The writings, which of course are kind of a combination of those things, but through all of the Tanakh, there's a prefigurement of Messiah, <clears throat> who Yeshua is, what he will do, and how he will do it. And people, um, as you know, people in the church generally kind of make funny faces when you say you should study the Torah. Some people have tried reading, some people have read Genesis and Exodus. But then when they get to Leviticus, it's pretty tough going. They get all weirded out. And I always like to point out to people who react that way is, yes, the book of Leviticus is all about blood, and it's all about just gory, horrible stuff. And that is because sin is, hoary, is um, horrible, gory stuff. And sin has to be dealt with because sin brings death and there has to be a way to bring life, to bring people, as David said, saves me from going down into the pit. <clears throat> or he says he opens the gates of righteousness that I may enter. And there has to be a way for that to be done. And Torah not only gives us the law, but also shows us what is going to happen when Messiah comes. It's a prefigurement. There are types. And so um, it's very important to study. If um, if you look online also on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel called The Torah Class, The Torah Class, where there's it's a 33-part study of the Torah, which is basically for people who don't know a lot about Torah. 
people who might want to be who are interested in some way to learn about it if you've been studying torah for 50 years i wouldn't suggest that you do the class or the course or whatever you want to call it because it'll be too simple but along with being a um, study of torah the passages and so forth the emphasis of it is on the types and prefigurements of messiah whether it's the sacrifices or the people or <clears throat> the circumstances that are that are there and so that's all i'm going to say about that and then um you'll see at the end a slide that has some websites and two podcasts and the youtube channel but uh if if you're interested in this ministry and again this is kind of a hebrew roots one new man ministry of which there are many i'm sure that if you google hebrew roots you'll find three and a half million hits <laughs> and if you got if you if you google one new man it'll probably be a million and a half but these are important because this is the whole plan this is this is the whole unwinding of the plan of salvation and that the messiah yeshua doesn't just come into time and space randomly and then gentiles suddenly say oh yes he's the messiah he's the savior and so we're going to follow him this is all prefigured it's all prophesied it's it's all foretold right down to Gentiles coming into the kingdom. And if you remember, I don't remember the chapter, but in the book of Isaiah, God tells Isaiah, I, I'm never going to do anything without telling you first. Prophecy is such an important part of all of the scripture that things don't happen suddenly and without any kind of um warning everything that he's going to do is prophesied and isaiah mentions that so we are located we are located in cleveland if you live in the cleveland ohio area we have a live session of one in messiah every friday night the only fridays we don't meet are the friday after thanksgiving and Good Friday to give people a chance to go to their churches and whatever other Good Friday services they, they attend. But every other Friday, we are there, and we meet at 709 Brook Park Road, 709 Brook Park Road, which is Calvary Chapel of Cleveland. It's a very nice facility. There's good highway access from east side, west side, south side. You don't have a north side here because that's in Lake Erie. <laughs> but anyway, so good highway access. We gather there about 6.15. We usually start about 6.30, 6.35. Uh, it's a modified Arab Shabbat service. We light the Shabbat candles. We recite the Shema, the Via Hafta, <coughs> the Amidah. We have some praise and worship, and then I do a teaching. So if you're in the area, pop in and say hello. It would be great to see you. And so that's all I'm going to say about that. But I always like to do a little bit of advertising. And I also have a radio program here, uh, one of the Christian channels in Cleveland. And that's on every Sunday evening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And no matter where you live, you can hear the program by going to www.thewordcleveland.com, thewordcleveland.com. And so that'll be enough advertising for now. If there's time at the end, which there never is, and do some more advertising. <laughs> but anyway. What we're going to do today is a continuation of what we started doing 
last week. Because even though this program is on for 57 minutes, more or less, um, I didn't get through the PowerPoint, didn't get through the lesson. And I didn't want to rush through the important part, which was the last, I don't know, five or six slides of a PowerPoint. And so I elected to carry it over to today. So if you didn't watch last week's, that's okay, because I'll do a quick recap, a quick summary, and I promise it'll be quick because I get kind of tired of running out of time myself. And people that come on Friday nights to our unofficial congregation, whenever I say this is going to be a short teaching, everybody either laughs or rolls their eyes because they know it's not going to be short. But I'm going to try to stay on on course now so this doesn't go into a third session that I'm almost positive that, that it won't. But last week we started with a passage, a passage from John's Gospel. And it's in John chapter 5. And this occurs immediately after Yeshua heals the paralyzed man who is sitting next to the pool at Bethesda. And you remember that um, whole passage, but the story is that this man was paralyzed for many, many years. I don't remember the exact number of years. I'm going to put up all the scriptures, but there was this thought, a legend, or most people think it had some pagan background, some pagan implications to it, but the legend was that a, an angel would stir the waters of the pool. And if you could get yourself into the water while the water was moving, you would be healed of whatever your disease was. And so if you recall, this poor guy could, couldn't make it to the, to the pool and Yeshua interacts with him and he ignores the subject of angel stirring the water. He ignores the subject of, you know, don't believe any of this. This is a pagan practice. It, he doesn't mention it at all. What he does is heal the man and tells him to pick up his pallet and go home. So, of course, the man picks up his pallet, he goes home, and he has an unpleasant interaction with a group of Pharisees, which leads to another interaction of this group of Pharisees with Yeshua himself. And you know, through all of the Gospels, these, I don't want to call them confrontations, but these interactions, confrontations are fairly common. And they really point out some important concepts to keep in mind. And everybody's heard of the Pharisees. And to make a long story short, they were men who were set apart. In fact, their name from Perushim means the set apart ones. And they had been set apart because they kept the law and they were righteous. Nobody else kept the law, but they did. The problem was, it wasn't Hashem, it wasn't God who set them apart. They set themselves apart. You don't see anywhere in the scriptures, even in the apocryphal books that are after Malachi's time and before the Gospels, there's no mention of Pharisees, there's no mention of God telling anyone, telling a prophet that they should set up this group and that, you know, all the men who are going to be in this group were going to be holy and they were going to wear all kinds of cool stuff and they were going to be in charge of everything. You don't see that anywhere. So it isn't exactly clear how this was set up, but it was set up sometime 
between the Maccabees and Messiah coming on the scene. So at the time of Yeshua, having Pharisees was a relatively new, a relatively new thing. They weren't ever mentioned before, so we have to assume they didn't exist in that form. But I like to call them the the they were kind of the inquisition of their time. They wanted to make sure that the law wasn't violated, and they took great pains to deal with people who didn't keep the law, especially the Sabbath, especially the Sabbath. Now, as it turns out, this healing started a problem because it says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Yeshua and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Shabbat. So this was the seventh day. This was the Shabbat. This comes up numerous times. I'm not going to go over all the examples, but it happens on the Shabbat, which, of course, the law says that you don't do any work. You don't carry a burden on the Shabbat. And they jumped on this guy who has now been healed because he's carrying his pallet. And it's Shabbat. So Yeshua seizes on this concept of work in this particular passage. In another passage, you know, he says, is it, is it good to do good on the Sabbath or evil on the Sabbath? You know, should you help somebody on Shabbat or should you just say, hey, tough luck, bub, I can't do anything for you. He says, if your sheep falls in a ditch and it's the Sabbath, do you just leave the poor thing there because you can't dig it out? He says, no, you take the animal out of the ditch. Talks about David's men eating the showbread. It, but in, uh, I'm already going on a tangent. But here he uses this concept of work. And he says, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. So you don't do work on the Shabbat. He says, my father and I have both been working right up until this point. So this angered them even more because now, not only had he broken the Shabbat, but he said that God was his father, which, of course, he was making himself equal. This comes up, of course, at the time of the crucifixion, where people said he made himself equal to God. And we can't have that. And to a certain degree, their thinking was expected and was normal, because here was a man who says, God is my father. So this is a natural reaction, just like this Sunday when you're at your church, and if some man stands up to do a reading and says, well, God's my father, and here's what I'm doing here. You wouldn't say, hopefully, oh, wow, God is his father, so we better listen to what he has to say. No, you would escort him to the door and say, don't come back here, which you should do that anyway. But anyway, so this made them even more angry. They had issues with him that were ongoing. This wasn't just about the honor of the Shabbat. They were very happy in their legalism. The legalism covered their hatred. And their hatred at this point was such that they wanted to kill him. And this is why Yeshua says in Matthew 16, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven always represents sin. Though they look good from the outside, but inside they're sepulchers with dead men's bones inside. They're dead inside. But the outside looks like a whitewashed tomb, looks very nice. You know, he says, do what they tell you, but don't do their works. This is where we get to don't practice. He doesn't practice what he preaches. He calls them a brood of vipers. John the Baptist calls him a brood of vipers. When you call the Pharisees a brood of vipers, it doesn't endear you to them. They don't like that. No religious leader of our time would like to be called a viper. A viper is a poisonous snake. 
Yeshua says to them later, after this, that not only, not only do you not get into the kingdom, but you prevent others from getting in. So these are quite harsh condemnations. We pointed out in Psalm 118, it says, they surround me like bees. You know, this is one of the Hallel Psalms that you say at the say that you sing or recite at the Seder, the Psalms of praise. And here's this, there's many messianic things in those Psalms. We're not going to go into all that. But one of them is Psalm 118 too. They surround me like bees. There's enemies surrounding him on every side, buzzing around. And they do, in fact, have a sting because of the power that they had at that time. So here he cl clearly states that he's the son of God. He says, God is my father. So his authority is unquestioned. And in another place, he says, well, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. You guys are always talking about the Shabbat. I'm the Lord of the Shabbat. And man was not made for the Shabbat, but the Shabbat was made for man. It's for our well-being. It's for our, it's for human flourishing. God's laws are all about how you have human flourishing. Because we see what happens when laws are violated. We see what happens when the moral laws are violated, laws of conduct are violated. Worship laws are violated. We can go on and on and on. But it's good for man to have the Shabbat. It's good for man to have a day where you worship and you don't work. You rest and you get away from your normal work. As we would say, you don't go to your job that day. You don't go to the office. You don't do your paperwork at home. You enjoy time with your family. You rest. You worship in the morning, have a nice dinner. So he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is made for man. So it's better to do good on the Sabbath than it is to do evil, of course. And he says, my father and I have both been working. You know, the priest, as you know, if you study the law, the priests were exempt from the prohibition of work on Shabbat, because, of course, they worked on Shabbat. You know, that's like asking a minister or a priest or somebody in a church, do you work on Sundays? And you just can say that as a joke and everybody laughs, because that's the day that they work. And so the priests, the Levitical priests, were exempt from the prohibition of work because they conducted the rituals. They conducted the services. They were at the temple. They, the synagogues were going. This is when people got together to worship. People carried the scrolls. You're not supposed to carry anything on the Shabbat, but you had to carry the Torah scroll, the, the scroll of the, of the prophets and, and so forth. They were exempted. So he says, my father and I, we work. Even though it's Shabbat, this man is healed. The man with the withered arm that he told to stretch forth his arm was also a Shabbat. It was in a synagogue. And instead of the people being happy that this poor man now had a good usable arm, they were upset that Yeshua had violated the Shabbat. So he gets the concept of work and says, my father's been working, I've been working. And as I said last week, the Greek that's used there means my very own father. He doesn't use father in a sense that we say, well, God is our father. And yes, God is our father if, if we're following Yeshua, because we know in Romans 8 and in Galatians 4, we become adopted sons and daughters, and our spirit cries out, Abba, Daddy. 
But the phraseology here is different. He says, my very own father and I. Meaning this is, he's talking about his real father. And he's not talking about Joseph. Joseph, of course, is not on the scene at this point. But he's not talking about his unearthly father. Because he says, the father and I are both working on the Shabbat. And how else is he working? Well, <clears throat> Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, he's maintaining the whole universe. It says the whole universe he maintains. Everything hangs together. He deals with everything that's going on in the universe. And Canagraph, the Bible answer man, always says, there's not a maverick molecule in the whole universe that Yeshua doesn't know where it is or what it's doing or how it got there. He holds the whole universe together and he gives us our next breath or decides don't have any more breaths. He regulates all of these things. And the Shabbat was made for us. This is still the summary. <laughs> So they're determined to kill him. He's a blasphemer because he's equated himself to God. He's a Sabbath breaker because today is Yom Shabbat and he did work. And he told this other guy to pick up his mat. So he caused this other man to also violate the Shabbat. So was there mercy and grace here? No. They could have cared less that this poor man who had been crippled for decades was now walking around. And that he was going home carrying his mat. They could have cared less about that. They were more concerned that the Shabbat had been violated. And I um, think I mentioned last week, but... They, um, friend of mine who is a cardiologist, well, both retired now, but he retired quite a bit time before I did. So he's older than I am, but um, a Jewish man who was, I don't know how observant he was, but appeared to be observant by what he said. He, you know, he pointed, he, we had a long talk one day about how of course, I would tell him about Yeshua and he would roll his eyes and, you know, that we're not going to get into that. But we had a long talk one day about how the rabbis, the council of rabbis or whatever the council was at the time, had to debate whether if someone had a heart attack and their heart stopped on the Shabbat, was it lawful to do CPR? Was it lawful to do CPR? Because you have to do the breaths. You have to do the chest compressions. And this was a serious issue, it was seriously debated. And they concluded <clears throat> that, yes, it was fine to do that because if you save the person's life, that was a good thing. And it far outweighed the fact that you had done work on Shabbat. So I pointed out to this cardiologist, I said, well, that was exactly Yeshua's explanation of this. Then, of course, he rolled his eyes again. But the, the concept is the same. Then he goes on to say, this is John 5, 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to who he will. So the Father, capital F, raises the dead, gives life to them, the Son gives life to who he wills. So the Son, meaning him, Son of God and Son of Man, when he called himself the Son of Man, which was very common, this was, of course, a reference to Daniel chapter 9, and this also angered the Pharisees because they knew he was claiming to be Messiah. But now he's talking about his Father, he's talking about himself as the Son, and he says he gives life to whoever he wants, just like the Father does. He can raise the dead. He can give life because he has life in himself. He's El Shaddai. He's the self-sufficient, the all-sufficient one. He doesn't have a cause 
and he doesn't need anything to exist. We don't have to produce anything for God to exist. And of course, the Son and the Father are equal in honor and power and majesty, and they're co-eternal, and, and we're not going to talk about the Trinity because we'll be here for days and weeks and months and years, and we still won't be any further in our understanding of it. Then he says, the Father's committed the judgment of men to the Son. He doesn't judge himself. The Son does the judging. Which we know, of course, when he comes back, that will happen. So the Son is the judge. He's the Son of Man. He understands man. He understands people because he is a human. He's 100% human. He lived for 33 years with humans. He still has his human body. He witnessed, he experienced everything that human beings experience, except he did not sin. Paul said he had the appearance of sinful flesh. He says he's like us in all things but sin. So when you think about it, he understands people. He saw the whole gamut of human existence while he was here, living in the same garbage dump that we live in. So I think we're getting toward where we left off last week, but verse 24, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. What's the alternative? Yeshua says, every idle word will come into your judgment. If you're not a believer, if you don't understand that Yeshua is the Messiah and that God the Father sent him, you don't believe in the God who sent him, you come into judgment. He says, if you believe in the Son, you won't be condemned. If you don't believe in the Son, you're condemned already. It's pretty clear, despite what your friends will tell you, despite what the tolerant people around you will tell you, Yeshua is very clear. It's short and to the point, and there's no question about it. He is the only way in. So he's saying this to the Pharisees who are angry that he worked on the Shabbat and he equated himself to God. <clears throat> so I like 27. He has given him, meaning the son, authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. This was the Messiah that was prophesied in the book of Daniel 500 years earlier, more or less. The visions, the night visions that Daniel has. He sees one was like a, a son of man being presented to the ancient of days. I was just to read that for your homework. Because if I start talking about it, then we'll never get through this. <laughs> so he is the son of man. So Messiah, as and the people that are listening to him talk at this point don't have a grasp of this. Even the early believers weren't sure what exactly this meant. And so these questions went around, is Yeshua divine? Is he human? Is he both? Is he a good man? Is he a creation? And becomes a partner in the rest of creation? Is he just divinity with what? appears to be a physical body, but he's God. Well, it was concluded as time went on that he was both. He's the son of God and the son of man. And so all the prophecies come together on that. It's interesting that in the Hebrew scripture and the Hebrew literature, David's not called a prophet. But Yeshua talks about the prophet, I'm sorry, Daniel, I don't mean David, Daniel, Daniel. 
Daniel's not called a prophet. Yeshua says the prophet Daniel. So that's interesting. So Yeshua calls him a prophet because he prophesied of the Son of Man. And he says, I'm the Son of Man, and I'm here. I'm going to be the judge. So this is the new covenant. If you believe, you pass out of judgment. You pass from death to life, he says. But if you don't believe, you don't pass from death to life. You know, you may spend 100 years being in the best possible physical condition that you can be in. You can maintain all your physical processes perfectly. You can go to a doctor every hour and a half. You can jog, you can do whatever. But then if you die at age 100 and you don't believe, you're subject to the judgment. And Yeshua said, what if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Then what good is that? You know, everybody who knows me is tired of me saying this, but it's the way we the way we've lived our lives. We think like the things we worry about are always going to be the important things. And so I like to point out that a billion years, and there's no time, and we're talking about eternity, I understand, but just to make a hyperbolic point, a billion years from now, if you're in heaven. <coughs> Are you going to remember what your salary was this year? Are you going to remember whether you got a bonus or not? Are you going to remember that you put an addition on your house? Are you going to remember what your cholesterol was today? No, and you won't care. You could care less. And alternatively, if a billion years from now you're in hell, you're not going to care about those things either. No one's going to walk around saying, you know, I had my cholesterol down to 100. I made 170 pounds. I was really fit. Yeah, I know that was a billion years ago, but no, you're not going to care. So he says, if you believe, you pass from death to life. So spiritual people hear his voice. And a living faith, what he's saying here is a living faith brings life. The law doesn't do this. The law does not do this. But a living faith brings life. So this is a very powerful message about the plan of salvation that Yeshua gives to these religious leaders in a very clear way, with no hesitation and without beating around the bush, like we do. We can't even... We can't even put together a statement of faith because we're so worried about what people are going to think. We can't even put together a statement of faith because we don't want our friends to think we're weird. We don't want people at work to think we're weird. We don't want to be canceled or whatever it is. We're afraid to talk to a false teacher and say what you're teaching is wrong. So he says, he tells them exactly what the situation is. Then he talks about you guys knew John the Baptist. You went to see him. 36, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You neither hear his voice at any time, nor see, nor have seen his form. You've never seen God, and you've never heard his voice personally, but he sent me, and the works that I do bear witness of this. That's why when they were going to stone him for blasphemy, he said, for which of my works are you stoning me for? Because the works are a testament, are a testimony to who he is and what he's doing. So John the Baptist bore witness. You know, he, of course, was a subordinate light. He bore witness. The works that Yeshua does prove that he's from the Father, prove that what he says is true. 38, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him, you did not believe. You don't have God's word in you because you don't believe 
the one that he sent. You don't believe whom he sent. So the one that God sent, you don't believe him. Why? Because you don't have the word abiding in you. Your traditions make my word of no effect because you teach the precepts of men as law. Yeshua hits them with that and Matthew much later on. But the point is, if you had a living word inside of you, you would have recognized him as the Messiah. But you don't, and so you don't believe. You don't know him. You don't have his word. So you don't believe me. You don't know God's word, so you don't believe me. You guys spend all your lives studying the scriptures, but you don't have that word in you. You just know a lot of facts. You've got a lot of it memorized. You know a lot of facts. But if you really understood that word, you would believe me. So this, of course, makes them crazy. If the word was in your heart, if the word was in their hearts, then they would know Yeshua. <laughs> so the word, capital W, the Lagos, John chapter 1, the Lagos was among them. He was standing there talking to them, a living word, but the word was not in them. It's really quite remarkable. These were the religious leaders who knew all of the law, all of the traditions. They had huge passages of scripture memorized, counted out every piece of grain and every little grain of salt and knew exactly where everything was supposed to be positioned, but they didn't have the word in them. So the word, the Logos, was standing there talking with them, but the word that they had been studying wasn't in them. I love 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. In other words, you search through the scriptures, the scriptures are about me. All the scriptures testify of me. All the scrolls are about me, whether you're studying Torah, whether you're studying one of the prophets, whether you're studying one of the writings. And then we can add later the Brit HaDashah. As you study these scriptures, the scriptures testify of me. So even though you spend your whole life studying, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life, verse 40. You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. In other words, if you don't come to him, you don't have life. If you understood Torah, if you understood the prophets, if you understood the writings, that's all three parts of the Tanakh, you would understand who he is. And you would go to him and have eternal life. But you guys, you don't get it. You're way smarter than all those people I was talking to up in Galilee. And you're way smarter than almost anybody else I know. But you don't get the truth. You don't get the foundation of this. The scriptures are about me. Moses can't save you. David can't save you. John the Baptist can't save you. I can save you. I'm the only one who can save you. So if you understood the scriptures, you would understand that. And you would come to me so that you could have life. You don't want life, though, because you're more interested in the scrupulosity of the law. You're more interested in how long the prayer should be, how big the tefillim should be, where you should stand when you say the prayer. If you say a prayer that's 528 words, it's much better than a prayer that's 120 words. If you have on the right kind of vestments, the right kind of clothes, the right kind of covering of your Torah scroll, but you don't want to come and have life. You guys are always studying. You study very diligently. You hear the cycle of the readings year after year. The synagogue, or in their case, at the temple, 
They all point to me. They're all about me. But you missed it. You missed the point of all of this. Quite a stirring condemnation. And if you really want to hear a whole stirring, similar type of condemnation, it's of the whole chapter 23 of Matthew, which if you've never read it, I don't know what to tell you, but you should go and read it. Because it really hammers home the fact that you either understand salvation or you don't. You're either scrupulous for the things or you come to him to be saved. So you guys do all this stuff, but you don't come to me. You missed what it's all about. You missed what all of these things pointed to. Really pretty, pretty striking and pretty powerful. 43, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. I'm here in my father's name. I'm the son of man. As you say, I and the father are one. But you don't receive me. But if somebody else shows up, someone who wrote a great rabbinical commentary, somebody who is the most unbelievable, scrupulous person in the law, like Paul talks about in Galatians 1, you'll, you'll believe him. And that was not just going on then. It was going on right after this. After Yeshua had departed. And it's still going on today with the people of Israel. It's still going on today. He's the one, Yeshua is the one who sent from the Father. He's the God-man. He's the Son of Man. If you don't take him, but you'll take somebody else. This was, of course, really ultimately personified and before Pilate when they wanted Barabbas released and they wanted Yeshua killed. That's kind of the extreme example of all this, but if anybody else comes in their own name, oh, I'm a great teacher. Oh, look what I've written. Yes, we love you. You'll take him. You'll receive him. Some leader in, a, in the church somewhere writes some paper and you say, oh, wow, this is amazing. It's all wrong and it's nothing about Yeshua, but why is this well done? I think we accept this guy. So this is the point he's making. You don't come to me, and I come from the Father. But somebody else comes in their own name. I love that. This really, and, and this is what I was saying earlier about how he understands humans, because he is human. But he knows how the human mind works. Really pretty amazing. It's, it's, and and it's, you know, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking that I just heard a teacher earlier today say what you hear a lot, that um, God does not send you to hell. You send yourself to hell because you have no interest in him. You have no belief in him. You could care less what he has to say to you. You don't care about the provisions he's made to prevent you from going to hell. So you die, and the basic bottom line is, well, you don't want to have anything to do with me, so now you're going to get what you've wanted. So they'd believe untrue things and reject the true things. Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13 point this out. This is a pretty well-known passage. They reject the living water and they hew out broken cisterns. They make their own cisterns. They don't like the ones with living water. Yeah, we want to make our own. They have broken cistern. What's a broken cistern? A cistern collects water, mostly rainwater, but collects water. If you have a broken cistern, it doesn't hold the water. 
So they don't want the living water. They want broken cisterns. 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses. Can you imagine the look on their faces? I'm not going to accuse you before the Father. There's one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. You trust in Moses. You don't want to hear me. You trust in Moses. Remember when the Pharisees said, we're disciples of Moses. We don't know who, where this guy comes from. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird translation. You know, most English translations say, we don't know where this fellow is even from. They didn't bother asking him where was he born. They didn't mind asking him how the, the ancient prophecies and the prophecies from a few hundred years ago were fulfilled in him. They didn't want to ask him any questions. All they had was condemnation. They say, well, we're disciples of Moses. We don't know who this guy is. So he says, "In there's one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. You trust in Moses for your salvation. But guess what, boys? Moses can't save you. You can try and try and try to keep the law, and you should keep the law, but you're going to fail. And Moses can't do anything about that, but I can. 46. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Whoa. So you've put your faith in Moses. You put your trust in Moses. He says, but if you believe Moses like you say you do, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. Everything that Moses wrote prefigured me, prefigured what I'm here to do, prefigured what I'm here to tell you. But if you don't believe what Moses wrote, you won't believe my words. When John the Baptist's messengers went to Yeshua and said, are you the one or are we to look for another? He quotes from Isaiah, a messianic prophecy about what Messiah is going to be doing. You see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Prisoners are released. When he reads at the synagogue of Nazareth, he talks about he's come to bring the year of Jubilee, and he says, I'm, I'm him, I am he. The scriptures fulfilled today in your hearing. So if you don't believe Moses, you're not going to believe my words. These guys, all they did was do Moses. All they did was the law. But he's condemning them. He's putting the pressure right on the pressure point. If you believe Moses, you'd believe me. If you believe what Moses wrote, you would believe what I'm telling you. Now, their answer, of course, would be, hey, we believe everything Moses said. You know, Moses was the foundation of the Tanakh. They were proud to be his disciples. They should be. We should be. People always ask me, aren't you tired? Don't you ever get tired of talking about Moses? I say, no. I can talk about it all day long. We should be proud to be, to know about Moses. But Moses was actually a witness the Messiah, a witness about Messiah coming, the prefigurement with the types, the mediators. So he says, if you don't believe what Moses wrote, you won't believe me. Because I'm here, I'm from the seed of the woman, not from the seed of a human man. I'm the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham that all Goyim will be blessed through me. I'm the prophet that Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy 18. All that talk about blood atonement in Torah is what I'm going to do shortly. And there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, as Paul is going to write later to Timothy.
I'm going to be the mediator. The writer of Hebrews says that's why he's the eternal high priest, because he's the only mediator. So Moses wrote about Yeshua. He didn't write against him. The problem is they don't understand what Moses wrote. They don't understand the plan. They don't understand how the plan unwinds. They don't understand the continuum of the plan. And so he accuses them of this. You, you trusted Moses? Well, you don't understand what Moses wrote. Because if you did, you'd be listening to me. If you understood what Moses wrote, you'd understand me because Moses wrote about me. Everything he wrote was about me. So this really puts the pressure on him. Woo, that's an awesome passage. Well, I finally got it done, and I'm even about 30 seconds time, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm glad you tuned in. And I'm not sure what the program is going to be next week, but tune in. We'll be live at 4 p.m. Eastern time on lambnetwork.tv. And again, to mention the on-demand tab to watch this anytime you want to watch it. So thanks for tuning in. 